You know who else is from Indiana? What? What? No. John Green. No. Adrian. John Green is from Indiana. Two of the greatest authors of all time from Indiana. Dare I say, dare I say it, John Green, the modern Kurt Vonnegut. It was at that moment that Dalton Gentry became unstuck in time. He found himself on November 15th, 2015, the first time he ever went to meet with Adrian Fort about the founding of Strip Cover Lit. He found himself at 9 p.m. on August 3rd, 2008, two years before he ever officially met Adrian Fort. The night his girlfriend at the time had broken up with him. Unstuck. Welcome to Strip Cover Lit. I'm Adrian Fort. And I'm Dalton Gentry. And we're here with this week's book review, and we got a big one today. What is it, Dalton? I just one of my favorites. Yes. One of my favorite authors, one of my favorite novels. Sla who, shut up. Who told you about this book? Shut up. Slaughterhouse Five, Kurt Vonnegut. Yes. I'm excited for it. And a lot of people apparently are reading along with us now, which is awesome because we yeah. do TBRs, like, you know, <laughs> we should have been the whole time. Like real booktubers. Uh, where do, do you want to start good and bad with this? Sure. Okay. Yes. Three good things. Number one. This is an utterly charming novel. Okay. Number two, the voice of Vonnegut is such that you've never read Vonnegut before. Yes. Uh, once you once you read Vonnegut, you have a clearer understanding of what the term voice means. Absolutely. Number three, in this one very short novel, 215 pages, I believe, you are taken so many different places. Yeah. Uh, good things. Uh, like I said, the voice of Vonnegut is unlike any other writing you've ever encountered. Uh, we use the term voice of Vonnegut constantly, but it's definitive. Yes. It, this defines, uh, we did A Man Without a Country, a full review of that. Yes. We talked about Vonnegut, the voice of Vonnegut the whole time. Because that, that novel is just the voice of Vonnegut. Right? Absolutely. Book. Uh, there is a mix of humor and tragedy in this piece that's just pure mastery. And this is disguised as science fiction and sold as science fiction, but is absolutely not at all science fiction which is an achievement to pull off. Okay. Bad uh, things. Number one, because of the way this novel starts, mm -hmm. I don't know that I would pick this up and love it today. Okay. Uh, two, the novel ends very abruptly. Yes. Uh, more abruptly than I was hoping for once you really get into the heat of the novel. Yes. Right? And number three, there's a, there's, a few quips in the novel, a lot of what we do here is we break down what we think the novel means, right? Mm -hmm. um, for me, there's this element thrown in several times of somewhere in the distance a dog is barking. I couldn't quite figure that out. Okay. And it bothers me. Okay. So that, of that, that's maybe not a fair criticism, but it is my criticism. Okay. Uh, this can be a muddled, confusing mess if you don't read it with an open mind. Yeah. Uh, you will get lost, and I think that's a lot of the difficulty a lot of people have getting into this. Uh, under the disguise of a science fiction novel, it really is a poor science fiction novel. And if you're not ready for Vonnegut in your life, his writing is going to infuriate you. Yeah. This will piss you off to no end. Yes. Uh, I, I really just want to get into it, but hold me back. Keep me, yeah. Let's do some quotes. Let's do quotes. Okay, on page 34. Roland, Weary, and the scouts were safe in a ditch, and Weary growled at Billy. Get out of the road, you dumb motherfucker. The last word was still a novelty in the speech of white people in 1944. It was a fresh and astonishing to Billy, who had never fucked anybody, and it did its job. It woke him up and got him off the road. On 39, and I've got, I've got too many quotes here. So. I highlighted this entire novel. I'm like trying to pick out the ones I wanted. Like so many Americans, she was trying to construct a life that made sense from things she found, gift, she found in gift shops. Uh, on 78, I've got, I just have to tell the story. <laughs> this is an entire little excerpt, but I have to read it. And Billy let himself down oh so gradually now, hanging on to the diagonal cross brace in the corner in order to make himself seem nearly weightless to those he was joining on the floor. He knew it was important that he make himself nearly ghost-like when laying down. He had forgotten why, but a reminder soon came. Pilgrim, said a person 
he was about to be nestled with. Is that you? Billy didn't say anything, but nestled very politely, closed his eyes. God damn it, said the person. That is you, isn't it? He sat up and explored Billy rudely with his hands. It's you, all right. Get the hell out of here. Now Billy sat up, too. Wretched, close, wretched, close to tears. Get out of here. I want to sleep. Shut up, said somebody else. I'll shut up when Pilgrim gets away from here. So Billy stood up again, clung to the cross brace. Where can I sleep, he asked quietly. Not with me. Not with me, you son of a bitch, somebody said. You yell. You kick. I do? You're goddamn right you do. And whimper. I do? Keep the hell away from here, Pilgrim. And now, there was an acrimonious madrigal, with parts sung in all quarters of the car. Nearly everybody seemingly had an atrocity story of something Billy Pilgrim had done to them in his sleep. Everybody told Billy Pilgrim to keep the hell away. Yes. On 101... <laughs> Yeah, we're just going to end up reading the entirety of the novel. Yeah. We're not going to talk about anything. Another time, Billy heard Rosewater say to si another time Billy heard Rosewater say to a psychiatrist, "I think you guys are going to have to come up with some with an awful lot of new lies, or people are just going to not want to go on keep living." I butchered that one, but it's okay. And probably my favorite quote from this novel, something that's stuck with me since the very first time I read this years and years ago. How nice to feel nothing and still get full credit for being alive. Look at that. It's Look very Adrian. Uh, I have three that I decided that I needed to read. Uh, we're going to go in reverse chronological order because why? <laughs> uh, so Makes Billy, sense with this novel. Exactly. Right? From page 143. So Billy experiences death for a while. It is simply a violent light and a hum. There isn't anybody else there. Not even B Billy Pilgrim is there. Love it. Yeah. 99. Under morphine, Billy had a dream of giraffes in a garden. The giraffes were following gravel paths, were pausing to munch sugar pears from treetops. Billy was a giraffe, too. He ate a pear. It was a hard one. It fought back against the, his grinding teeth. It snapped in juicy protest. The giraffes accepted Billy as one of their own, as a harmless creature, as pre-posteriously specialized as themselves. Excuse me, I'm just making up words again. Uh, two approached him from the opposite sides, leaned against him. They had long, muscular upper lips, which they could shape like the bells of bugles. They kissed him with these. They were female giraffes, cream and lemon yellow. They had horns like doorknobs. The knobs were covered with velvet. Why? That's the whole paragraph. Yeah. That sells me on Vonnegut every fucking time. 54. The two scouts who had, deal, who had ditched Billy and Weary had just been shot. They had been lying in ambush for Germans. They had been discovered and shot from behind. Now they were dying in the snow, feeling nothing, turning the snow to the color of raspberry sherbet. So it goes. Now that we've wasted a third of our time reading quotes. I've got like 80 more if you yeah. want to keep going. I mean, wh what I, do you I, want to talk about with this? I had to cut out three while I was reading them because I was like, well, this isn't going to work. <laughs> uh, I have quotes highlighted to highlight points that we've been trying to make for months on this channel. Yeah. Free will, uh, everything. It's just... The, uh, the Trophimidorians are surprisingly humanist, are they not? You think so? Yeah. Okay. This idea that we live forever. Yes is basically the idea that we live forever in the minds and the lives of those that we touch. Yes. So say there's some five-year-old kid today, and I make an impact on him that says, hey, I don't know, look both ways before you cross the street. Yeah. Right? Well, then he's going to pass that on to the next generation, the next generation, the next generation. Adrian Fort lives on forever. That's you living on forever. Not, I mean, that's obviously a, a trite way to say it. Okay. But when you, when you pass an idea like that on, it's you living forever. Um... It's just, it's amazing to see these, these small things that are humanist ideas uh, infused into aliens. Okay. Right? And uh, the aliens seem to be the better species. Uh, when the concept of war is brought up, uh, the uh, tra Trophimidorians, uh, I'm going to butcher that every time, excuse the aliens, uh, when they brought about the concept of war, I say it's really no big deal. We right. know how the universe is going to end. Right. It's just another spat. Why are you so worried about? Which, I'm not sure when the science came up that uh, the universe is likely to end in either heat death or collapse. Mm -hmm. But um, if that was after this, it is stunningly prescient, is it not? 
Yes, it would the, be. The, I didn't the, even think about that. That the humanists would know how the universe ends. Yes. Right? Uh, and that's the sci-fi aspect of Slaughterhouse-Five, which... This is not a sci-fi novel. This is a war novel. This is a war novel. And here's 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 my point. And this is this is the main thrust of my argument with this book. This is a war novel. This was noted as the author by the author as a war novel. It is titled something from the war. Um, here we go. The title page. Did you notice the title page? No. Here's the title page. Slaughterhouse Five, or The Children's Crusade, A Duty Dance with Death, by Kurt Vonnegut, a fourth-generation German-American now living in easy circumstance on Cape Cod and smoking too much, who is an American, in, who was an American, in, who as an American infantry scout, or to combat, as a prisoner of war, witnessed the firebombing of Dresden, Germany, the Florence of the, of the Elbe, a long time ago and survived to tell the tale. This is a novel, somewhat in the telegraphic schizophrenic manner of tales, of the planet Tralfamador, where the flying saucers come from peace. So that's the full title of this piece. So it identifies as a war novel. Yes. It uh, is written partially about the war. It's titled as a war novel, and it is noted as a war novel. Yes. How much of this novel is about? It takes place in the war. Good much it well. Maybe a third. Yes. I would say tops. One third of this takes place during the the war. But go on. He, well, here's my point with that. Um, this is a World War II novel. Yes. But look at all of the ways that we're explained to this with. Um, look at all the ways with which Vonnegut explains the war. So it goes is this small little phrase that normalizes death. There are, by my count, 107 so it goes in this novel. Which the impressive thing about that, so it goes, is every time that comes up, you go, so it goes. Yep. But it's someone dying. Yeah. Right? So that normalizes death. Time travel makes clear the inevitability of certain things, like war with the Trophimidorians. Aliens make us see how small our own planet really is, right? Okay. This why me bit that comes up several times mm -hmm. in the novel, why me? Uh, that captures the randomness of existence. These are the ways through which the World War II experience is yeah. explained. This post-World War strain of uh, nihilism, right? The OL nihilism, right? That is how this is explained. This is art in that way. That this is a, a war novel, but most of the things that explain to us about the war are not about war. Correct. So, let's take a look at perhaps a clumsier piece. Okay. The Fault in Our Stars. Okay. Right? Uh, written by another author from Indiana, by the way. I'm pretty sure John Green is from Indiana. Old Kurt Vonnegut, Indiana. Um, what is The Fault in Our Stars about? Kids with cancer. Kids with cancer. How do they explain kids with cancer? Not by using kids with cancer. By only using kids with cancer. Okay. What do you mean by not using kids I'm, with cancer? I'm trying to like follow along with what you're trying no, to no, go with no, here. No, just answer the question. What okay. is that novel about? It's constantly about kids with cancer. It's beat over okay. your head with kids with cancer. So where's the, where's the, where's the art there? It's just Stolen about kids literary with quotes. I right. <laughs> including, including, we might note. So it goes. So it goes. Uh, here's my big spiel on this. Yes, okay. this is a World War II novel. Yes, this is a war novel, anti-war novel, if you want to get more into it. Uh, this is sold as science fiction. If you go to the bookstore, and this is not in the classic section, this is in the science fiction section, because right. somebody looked at this book and said, oh, aliens, okay, science fiction. Right, aliens, time travel. Yep, science fiction. That pisses me off. It pissed Vonnegut off, too. Did it really? Is, from what I understand, yes. Okay, that's a good thing. Uh, but if you look at this at a realistic, uh, take out all the fantasy, all the science fiction, a realistic approach, is this Billy Pilgrim trying to cope with the war? I think it absolutely is, and I think that this time travel is nothing more than um, an artistic way to look at, for example... PTSD. I think so. Right. I think so, absolutely. And it could go either way. This could be the story of Billy Pilgrim in the war using this fantasy world as an escape because it only happens during the atrocities. Or okay. vice versa, this is old Billy Pilgrim trying to escape his flashbacks by creating a fantasy world right. where it's all okay. Uh, if I may, from page 74, because Vonnegut even seems to mention... Uh, an idea of going back in time to fix things, which would be Billy Pilgrim uh, actualizing what his 
conscious mind is doing. Right. American planes full of holes and wounded men and corpses took off backwards from an airfield in England. Over France, a few German fighter planes few, flew at them backwards, sucked bullets and shell fragments from some of the planes and crewmen. They did the same for wrecked American bombers on the ground, and those planes flew up backwards to join the formation. The formation flew backwards over a German city that was in flames. The bombers opened their bomb bay doors, exerted a miraculous magnetism which, sucked, which shrunk the fires, gathered them in cylindrical steel containers, and lifted the containers into the bellies of the planes. The containers were stored neatly in the racks. The Germans below had miraculous devices of their own, which were long steel tubes. They used them to suck more fragments from the crewmen and, and planes. But there were still a few wounded Americans, though, and some of the bombers were in bad repair. Over France, though, German fighters came up again and made everything and everybody as good as new. That is Billy Pilgrim realizing what he's doing. He's using his time travel, his going back, his flashbacks, whatever, to repair the damage that the war has done to him. Right. This so is his coping mechanism for PTSD. That so would be one of the... Uh, one shots I'd go for. So do you think that it says anything that that flashback is actually of him watching a movie? Possibly. Now at one point in the novel, he does mention that he doesn't travel back in time, he flashes back. He exists. He there. exists there. Uh, so he is admitting at, by his own words that he does have these flashbacks, that this is haunting him. This is all just a fantasy world for him to cope. Yeah. That's exactly what this is. And when you look at it that way, it's all the more tragic. All the more. Yeah. Um, now, the beginning of this novel is more biographical. It's Vonnegut talking about writing this novel, which is very weird. You said off-putting to you if you were to pick this up for the first time. Right. Uh, now, there is the phrase that I absolutely love because the balls to start your novel with, this is how it begins and this is how it ends, is glorious. Yeah. However... Vonnegut introduces this piece saying that, you know, I'm Kurt Vonnegut, I'm writing this. This is my story, basically. Vonnegut's Billy Pilgrim. Easy as that. I think that is a slippery slope to go on because Vonnegut also points out in the prison camp where he is, mm -hmm. right? He mentions himself twice. Yes. Where Billy Pilgrim sees him. The author of this novel, that was me. They was I was there, Yeah. right? So I, I think that, sure... Vonnegut is Billy Pilgrim. A lot of his experiences would have been through Billy Pilgrim. Vonnegut is also Vonnegut. Yes. And Vonnegut is also Kilgore Trout. Absolutely. So I think that this is a very easy novel to illustrate the fact that as writers, we are everywhere in our own work. I like that. Right. Uh, just a quick snippet to strengthen your argument for The Fault in Our Stars. You tell me, you look me in the eyes and tell me Van Houten is not directly stolen Kilgore Trout. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all it is. And and there's the there are literary references in here that are not well done, right? Okay. It's just a book thrown into things. Yeah. But Vonnegut has the credibility that you allow that to happen. Yes. I was not allowing John Green to get away with it. Correct. So and it just it it fueled my hatred. As much as I hated Van Houten, I love Kilgore Trout. Right. And I think that Van Houten was the best part of that novel. Okay. But, um, you mentioned he's in here, right? Vonnegut's gets yes. in here. On page 27, we get this. Billy was working on his letter in the basement rumpus room of his empty house. It was his housekeeper's day off. There was an old typewriter in the rumpus room. It was a beast. It weighed as much as a storage battery. Bill couldn't, Billy couldn't carry it very far or very easily, which was why he was writing in the rumpus room instead of somewhere else. He's writing... This is... Billy Pilgrim as an author. Yes. Right? Now, it's interesting that we have another author that we've read on this channel who s sustained serious head injuries in a plane crash. Hemingway? Yep. Okay. Took me a second. Yeah. So, I, I think that, and from what I remember, uh, I've read several pieces by Kurt Vonnegut where he's talking about writing. Yes. And I think he makes many Hemingway references. Okay. That this is how you do things clean. Okay. Right? Uh, and, you know, he, the voice of Vonnegut comes through with a lot of his writing. A lot of his things are very similar. Kilgore Trout is a reoccurring character. Yes. Uh, Vonnegut talking about Vonnegut writing Vonnegut is a reoccurring trope. Uh, but that's okay, though. Vonnegut's one of the only authors who can get away with that. Yeah, because he is so charming. I think so. And so self-effacing. And there's such an element of 
so it goes to his very style, is yes. there not? Just fucking delightful, uh, which is why so it goes will inevitably be tattooed on my chest. Yes. That's okay. Uh, now, any other comment you want to make real quick here? Uh, I don't you know if you were on a roll or not. Uh, I, I really just have to sit down and comment that... Have I read the entirety of Kurt Vonnegut's collection? Absolutely not. And, you know, I, you're going to get flack for that. Somebody out there is going to be like, oh, it's your favorite author, but you haven't read everything. Dick bag. Right. Excuse me. Uh, but it seems like anyone that I pick up, Cat's Cradle, Man Without a Country, just glorious. Absolutely glorious. And the voice of Vonnegut is something that is completely unrivaled. Nobody else can attempt it because nobody else can pull it off. Right. Vonnegut is the man that I strive to be. You may want to be Hemingway. I want to be Vonnegut. I never said I wanted to be Hemingway. You want to be Hemingway. You wake up every morning and just look yourself in the mirror and say, all right, Ernest, one more day of this. You got it. But uh, buy, no. the, buy the shotgun to <laughs> I don't know if this novel has it. I don't think it does. Uh, there's always that picture, his author picture, where he's sitting in his garden Oh, yeah. uh, with the purple flowers, whatever they are behind him, smoking his palm oil. Yeah. No, I want to be Kurt Vonnegut. <laughs> I, I want, like, that. I'm the crazy uncle who just, it's beautiful. He's fucking wonderful. Uh, I'm just going to gush, unfortunately, so uh, please stop me. Um, we, we, I've got a, just a few more things to talk about. Okay. Uh, on page 38, Weary, uh, Roland Weary, the, the mean feller, right? We get the quote that he says something, there's more to life than what you read in books. Okay. But Weary's always talking about death. He is. So is there more to life than we read in books, but it's all death? Art is where the life is. Okay. The real world is where death resides. So it goes. So it goes, you dark son of a bitch. I'm trying to find a quote here. I, I apologize For that I weary, didn't. Or what's it about? Uh, okay, here we go. Uh, they came to a prison railroad yard again. They had arrived in only two cars. They would depart far more comfortably on four. They saw the dead hobo again. He was frozen stiff in the weeds beside the track. He was in a fetal position, trying even in death to, nest, to nestle a spoon with others. There were no others now. He was nestling with the thin air and cinders. Somebody had taken his boots. His feet were blue and ivory. It was all right. Somehow, his being dead. So it goes. That is Ellie Weissel, Knight, Atrocities of War level. It is. That is comfortable, though. Right, and it's, it's strange. How do you achieve that? Because he's got that, uh, so it goes. You think that's what it is? Absolutely. Even without the so it goes. Well, even without the so it goes, because you know the so it goes is coming. Okay. That is probably 50 so it goes into the novel. Oh, that's towards the end. We're looking 70, 80 so it yeah. goes. Although there is a string towards the end where it's just like boom, boom, boom. Right. Uh, but that is war. That is war in a nutshell. Horrible atrocities, and you're just like, well, no, that's okay. it. You need boots. There's boots. Yeah. I mean, it'll save you from having to wear the, uh, what, what do you call them, moccasins? Yeah. Not moccasins. Whatever uh, Weary had to wear that eventually killed him. Yeah. Uh, man died in his boots, though, so, I mean, not that we're going to push Hemingway tropes or right. anything like that. <laughs> uh, another great thing about Vonnegut, because this is me gushing, uh, Vonnegut will draw for you on occasions. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to use the <laughs> example I highlighted today because it's just delightful, but page 209 if you have it. Uh, but even on the back, you get Vonnegut's little caricature of himself. Yeah. Uh, again, no other author pulls that off. No. If you doodle in your book, you're a children's author. Especially if you doodle as poorly as Vonnegut draws. As poorly as Vonnegut, because they're terrible drawings. Yeah. Uh, but he gets away with it every time. And it adds so much to the piece. It makes it comfortable. It makes it approachable. This is not a grizzled war veteran. This is not horrible. This is not a comedian. Right. This is just good old Kurt. This is Uncle Kurt telling you a story. Well, it sort of reminds me of, I, I, I've got this Andrew Jackson biography I read, and he's on his deathbed, and he keeps on dying, right? <laughs> Andrew Jackson died, and then he came back and said, well, but you better do this, this, this that, and the other. And he died, and he came back and said, well, hold on, we got to talk about this. And... Um, this was a thing, I guess. And one of his slaves had said, well, if Mr. Jackson wants to go on living, who's to tell him otherwise? Right? Okay. Um, if Kurt Vonnegut wants to go on drawing, who's to tell him otherwise? Yes. Right? Yes. 
Uh, um, Kurt Vonnegut's, Vonnegut's, I can't talk now. Kurt Vonnegut is the pinnacle of what every author should strive to be. <laughs> we live in a very PC culture world where everyone takes themselves very seriously. Yes. Uh, again, if you haven't checked out a review on A Man Without a Country, you need to check that out. That is Vonnegut just setting the pace for the future years that he's not going to see. Uh, but it's okay that Vonnegut does what he does. Yeah, and and he's someone who's been through something very serious, right? Yes. Like, n not someone looked at him cross in the line at Subway. Correct. So they m must be sexist, right? Like, exactly. It's not that. Exactly. This guy was a prisoner of war for the Nazis. Uh, what is that Rodney Dangerfield film? Is it Back to School? Yes. Back to School. That is the definitive what every author should strive to be. Kurt Vonnegut plays Kurt Vonnegut, who writes a report about, I believe, Slaughterhouse-Five. Yeah, I think so. And Rodney Dangerfield gets a C on the paper, so he calls <laughs> Vonnegut and bitches him out. Uh, Vonnegut makes a cameo being himself. And that, that is perfect. That is what you need to be a successful artist, is you need to be able to make fun of yourself. Yes. Uh, I, I think that's what we're just highly lacking in today's world. So nobody wants to have fun. We've got this, this story talking about nobody wants to have fun. Uh, we're going to have fun with religion here. Yes. Uh, the visitor from outer space made a gift to Earth of a new gospel. In it, Jesus really was a nobody and a pain in the neck to a lot of people who had better connections than he had. He still got to say all the lovely and puzzling things he said in the gospels. So the people amused themselves one day by nailing him to a cross and planting the cross on the ground. There couldn't possibly be any repercussions, the lynchers thought. The reader would have, th would have to think that too, since the new gospel uh, hammered home again and again that nobody was that Jesus was a nobody. Uh, and then, just before he, the nobody died, the heavens opened up and there was the thunder and lightning and the voice of God came crashing down. He told the people that he was adopting this bum as his son, giving him the full powers and privileges of the son of the creator of the universe through all eternity. God said this, from this moment on, he will punish horribly anybody who torments a bum who has no connections. What does that un until we get the until we get the violence at the end of that? Yes. What does that little retelling of the Christ story sound like? What does it sound like? Yeah. What other story that you've heard does it sound like? Uh, it sounds an awful lot like Cinderella, doesn't it? Okay. Uh, a nobody who gets suddenly a, becomes a somebody. Becomes a somebody. Okay. Uh, is this novel anti-religion as well? Sure. Oh yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Especially when you're dealing with fourth dimension things, like the aliens do, you know, with time. Yeah. Uh, how do you have a creator in a universe when the universe comes to an end? Well, here's why you should cut else. me off. Oh, excuse me. Because the end of that is <laughs> what happens later in this novel. They they end up at the with the Englishmen. Yep. At the in, as the prisoners of war, and the Englishmen are putting on a play of Cinderella. This is true. And what does Vonnegut leave with? Cinderella shoes. This is true. So Billy Pilgrim, or Vonnegut, I kept saying Vonnegut, didn't I? Pilgrim, Billy Pilgrim leaves with Cinderella's shoes, becomes Christ. Look at you. Look at you on a roll. Uh, I don't want to uh, summarize any more to, to this. No. <laughs> uh, everything was beautiful and nothing hurt. <laughs> that is it. Yeah, this is novel. Uh, what are you going to rate it? I would give this 96 Kilgores out of 100. I said 95. I'm like, you got to cut it off at 95. Yeah, it, it, I, I wanted, and honestly, I had planned 95. I don't know why I said 96. Because so. you wanted to one-up me, but that's Maybe. okay. Uh, easily one of the highest rated novels that we've read on this piece, uh, on this show. You can't go wrong with it. No. What would you suggest? You go first. Uh, I would suggest, you know, again, if you want to like Vonnegut, read more Vonnegut. Cat's Cradle. Cat's Cradle. And again, A Man Without a Country, if you haven't checked out yep. our full review on that one. I was not a fan of Cat's Cradle. I like Cat's Cradle. Ice I Nine have... is beautiful. Yes, it was, yeah. Um, I have an anti-suggestion. Okay. If you like Kurt Vonnegut, don't read John Green. <laughs> don't read John Green anymore. Okay, I'll give you that one. Uh, so if you like this and you want some more of it, make sure you hit the subscribe button down below. Give this video a like as well. Vonnegut deserves every single like we can get. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at Strip Cover and on Facebook at Strip Cover Lit.